Um, what I'm going to talk about today is, um, first of all, who I am. So I work for Sustainment Software. So we're a local Vancouver company, and our core business is the information management side of your work. So we, uh, we've been involved in, in this for 10 years and in projects right across Canada. So literally our, our bread and butter is that information. It's all the data, right? How do you guys manage your data? That sort of thing. So I'm going to talk about today is I'm not going to talk about products. I'm not here to, to show you what, you know, what our product is. But rather, I'm going to, to talk about some best practices. I'm going to talk about some tools, some tips um, that, um, that you guys can, can maybe take away um, and apply to whatever tools you're using for uh, the information management side of, of the work that you are doing. And I'm open for, uh, for suggestions as well, if there's anything that you, know, that you, that you guys have, have thought was, you know, was really helpful that maybe I didn't cover off today. I mean, that's how uh, literally we designed our, our product. Our product is purpose-built um, from feedback uh, from people like yourselves, right? So I'm going to start going through it then. Um, so first of all, just setting the stage, obviously, Aboriginal peoples are not stakeholders. Um, Relationship-driven versus deadline-driven. Obviously, this is this is nothing new to anybody that's taken Bob's uh, Bob's course. Uh, unique organizational structures, um, often blurred authority and responsibility, and then you've got the land component that also plays into it, right? So, if you put all that together, you know it's a quite complex data set that uh, that you are dealing with at the end of the day. And I like to put in here that. Those complexities are clear to the practitioner, right? So those of you that are out there doing work, I mean, it's in your heads, it's, the landscape is clear. Um, but the documentation, what that's gonna do is that's gonna enable you to, to share that information so that it's in a usable format um, and it'll help you demonstrate transparency of your processes. So moving on to that. Um, what we've seen as a company is that uh, there's no lack of record keeping. I mean, everybody's keeping everything um, on both sides of the table, right? If, if you want to call it a table. Um, but um, where the gap is, is, is not the risk management side of things in terms of the record keeping, but it's being able to, to tap into those records in order to tell the story of what's transpired, right? In order to mine your data, to find the information that you were uh, referring back to that you needed to refer refer back to, um, so the way that um, the, some of the tips that I'm going to share today will will help you uh, keep records if you are doing record keeping, um, and it's going to help you help your records tell that story for you. Okay. So one of the first tips that I'm going to I'm going to share with you uh, is and something that we found to be very successful is. Uh, what we call separating communication records from event records, all right? Now, we define a communication as, as what's up top there, so emails, phone calls, letters. Basically, it's however the, the, um, the message is delivered or received, okay? Uh, whereas events um, are the more formal placeholders uh, for related communications. That might sound confusing, but um, examples might be open houses, might be site tours, they might be ceremonies, they might be however you're interacting on a more formal level uh, with your stakeholders and, and Aboriginal communities, okay? And actually, I'm just going to go back to that. So um, oftentimes what happens is you have many communications that relate to a single event. So if we look at... Um, we look at a, a meeting uh, with, uh, with an Aboriginal group, for example. Uh, you might have communications that uh, lead up to that meeting. You might have communications that occur at that meeting. And then you might have a list, a laundry list of communications uh, to after that meeting in terms of follow-ups or requests for information. But at the end of the day, all of those communications relate to that one meeting, right? So if you sort that data properly and you group that data properly, it makes it very easy for anybody reading your report to understand exactly what happened. So what you're doing now is you are keeping all those records, you're keeping all the emails, you're keeping all the phone calls, you're doing all of that, but now, right, your, your records are, you're, they're usable. You, somebody doesn't have to take them and, and spend three days putting together a, a summary report so that somebody can understand exactly what happened. 
Another tip um, that I want to share with you is, um, is addressing the many hats that an individual can wear uh, during the engagement or consultation process. And this is probably the biggest challenge that, as an organization, our customers um, have had over the years, is tracking who's who in the zoo, right? Um, it's, uh, again, it's, it's something that is, um, it's, it's in the head of the practitioner. They know the landscape of who they're speaking to within their communities, right? Um, but if they were to move on, uh, let's say they were on a contract basis or, or what have you, um, how is that inform information retained so that um, it's captured and, um, and so that when somebody else goes into that community, um, they can make use of that information and all that work that has happened prior to that time, okay? So I'm going to show you a little, a little trick of, of how to do that. Um, setting up stakeholders as three entities is, is one way that, uh, that we've seen to be a success. And we define a stakeholder, um, and I'm just going to use, I'm just using the word stakeholder here, I'm just for, you know, for, just to be broad, right, only got 20 minutes, so. Um, but uh, individuals, groups, and I know it sounds um, uh, maybe not so appropriate sometimes, but pieces of land, okay? And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Let's say that, um, all right, okay, so first of all, an individual can be affiliated with more than one group, right? I'm sure all of you have seen that. An individual can also, or a group, group, can be affiliated with a land parcel. And let's have a look at, um, if we look at a trap line, for example, right? So you're talking to, to trappers um, about their interest in, in that line. So again, you might have multiple people that um, you're talking to about uh, that specific trap line, right? Or you may have um, areas of uh, cultural significance that uh, are um, related to the group of some sort, right? So they have interest in those areas, um, and therefore now you've got the group that's related to uh, that, that area of, of cultural interest. So I'm going to use me as an example here, okay? So I'm an individual, right? So if you're speaking to me about, um, I don't know, about the service that I had at the hospital over the last couple of days, right? then what I'm doing is I'm representing my own opinions and my own, and my own interests, right? It has nothing to do with the fact that I also work for Sustain, that, that I'm the mayor of the city of Vancouver. I made that up, by the way. Um, and <laughs> yeah. La last night at about 4.30 a.m. Um, and uh, yeah, it's really creative. And, and that I'm a trapper as well, okay? So when you're talking to me about my experience at the hospital, it has nothing to do with, with, with my interest in that land. It has nothing to do with the fact that I'm the mayor, that I work for Sustain Net, right? Um, it's my own interest, it's my own opinions. So when you hang up that phone with me, um, it's best that, that that phone record or that email record or however you're communicating with, uh, with your, your individuals, um, stay with the individ individual record, right? So you have Colin Ellis set up there as an individual and you link that communication to the individual record. Now let's say that I'm wearing my sustain net hat, right? Um, after you get off the phone with me, what I'm doing during that, during that dialogue, during the communication, is I'm representing uh, my employer, right? Actually, and so therefore I'm not your stakeholder, my employer is your, is your stakeholder in that instance, all right? You happen to be speaking to Colin, but if you know, Colin goes on maternity leave for the next year, then you'll probably be speaking to Howard, right? <laughs> because at the, end of the at the end of the day, sustain it as your stakeholder. So you want to make sure that you have a system or in your spreadsheets or however you're doing things where you can link that communication record directly to sustain that, the company, and then say, you know what, I happen to be speaking to Colin, okay? And then lastly, it has to do with land. Um, and this is, um, this is true for like a, a trap line is a, is a great example of that where you're going to be talking to these individuals because of their interest in that land, right? And if that land is, if that land is sold or handed down to the family, at that point you're going to be speaking to the new contacts of, of that piece of land because that land is, is uh, impacted by your activities of some sort, all right? So in actual fact, the land is your stakeholder and the, and the people that you're speaking to are going to be contacts for that land. And the reason why this is so important is because if you take a, a snapshot of the landscape of who you're speaking to across all of your Aboriginal communities today, right, and you do it two months from now, six months from now, two years from now, guarantee that, lands that landscape's gonna change, right? Um, but, and as that change, and you want it to change, 
you want to always make sure you have the, the, the you know, most update contacts in there. But as people come and go or move even uh, to different roles uh, following times of elections, you want to make sure that your communication record doesn't also go away when you update a contact. Um, for example, they're no longer associated with a group. All right. So if you've linked the communication record to these three entities, it, it, it takes care of that, uh, the many hats. Right, so it paints the landscape of who is who in the zoo very, very well. Um, but also it keeps integrity of your data as people come and go um, or move uh, between, within or, or between or away from groups or, or land. And just going back to land, um, any of you involved in energy projects such as wind farms or um, pipelines or transmission lines, um, those sorts of things, uh, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about because you'll do Aboriginal community engagement over here and you've got your stakeholders over here and you've got your landowners, right? And the only reason you're speaking to those landowners is because they live within a certain uh, distance to your project, right? So that's, that's exactly what I'm talking about here. Where it becomes increasingly more important, all right, so there's the communication, so it can be associated with the individual, the group, or the land. Where it becomes uh, increasingly more important is when you start talking about commitments, okay? Because commitments are, are going to be your promises that you're making to these people. And if commitments aren't upheld, um, that has an impact on trust at the end of the day, right? Which is what you've worked so hard to establish uh, throughout the process. So again, the commitment can be linked to the individual, uh, the group, uh, or the land. Because if you're making a commitment to SustainNet or the city of Vancouver, Right? You may make it to call-in, but the commitment record itself needs to be linked to the entity, which is sustain that software, the group, or the city of Vancouver, the group. Because if call-in doesn't win the election next term and he goes away, we want to make sure that that commitment also does not go away in your data. Extremely important. Because otherwise, two years from now, you could be stuck with a situation where you go in there and go, hey, wait a minute. You know, my team's been updating this, but this is not a true reflection of what happened. Now all of a sudden you've got data which is, I call it soup, because it doesn't really make sense anymore. It's kind of scary. Okay, so how am I doing for time here? You want to go five minutes? Five minutes? Okay. So I'm gonna, another trick is, is being able to help uh, identify roles, responsibility, and authority. And, um, and I learned this in Bob's group, right? So Aboriginal community engagement, uh, the duty to consult is, is consult with the community as a whole. And oftentimes, uh, roles, responsibility, and authority within a certain community um, is blurred. It could be very um, evident to, to, again, the practitioner who's in there, um, that are, who's in there building the relationships, but if that person goes away or they need to share that information with others, how easy is it for them to come in and make sense of what's going on within a community just from looking at the records? And this is a little trick that will help you uh, manage that. So the first one is to date and time stamp, or sorry, date stamp an individual's affiliation to those groups. So when I was talking about groups such as Colin being a manager at Sustainable Software and Colin being the mayor of the city of Vancouver, um, it's helpful to put in Colin was elected on this date and Colin was, you know, didn't win the election on this date and left office on this date, right? So there's a history of his involvement within that group. Also, if there was an election, and, 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 and uh, an Aboriginal community is a great example of that, people might uh, even switch roles within the group. So you could say, okay, Colin was a mayor from this date to this date, but then from this date to this date, he's now doing something else, all right? So it keeps a, an audit trail of people's movements to and from groups and within groups over time. Extremely important, again, because if you go back and refer back to your data, you want to be able to know, well, who was I speaking to at that group back in July 2009? Another one is, is looking at job title and role. Uh, job title is ambiguous, right? It doesn't really mean anything. I, I can call myself anything I want to at the end of the day, right, if it's going to help me. Um, but my role is, is something that you can clearly identify for almost any organization. If I look at my organization, for example, we've got sales, we've got accounts, uh, we've got administration, we've got marketing, right? So now, if you're using roles to identify what people do within those groups, it's, it's far more clear than using somebody's job title. And, and also, you're able to establish consistency. There's no way that you can establish consistency with uh, job titles because, like I said, everybody, um, at the end of the day, can, can put their own, their own, uh, their own wording to, it, to a title. 
The other hope, helpful thing is, is tracking uh, contact type, so a primary contact. Who do you send that letter to, for example, right? As well as preferred method of contact. Um, again, it's respectful to, to ask people how, you would, how they prefer that you, uh, that you communicate with them. And then finally, uh, we've got the group spokesperson. And that's just terminology, but what that means is um, who, who has the authority to make decisions within that group? And oftentimes, that's not clear. Um, you know, on the surface until you go in and do your work within that community and understand where the influences are and you understand the dynamics of that community, for example, right? So being able to track that information can be very helpful um, to, to others that, uh, that need to understand uh, the dynamic of a certain community. And again, the same thing applies to land, right? So because contacts can come and go, um, again, you want to be able to date stamp somebody's involvement with uh, a trap line, for example. Quickly, relationships. Um, there's two types here. We have stakeholder group relationships. So being able to track what we call a subgroup, subgroup relationship and external group relationship. So a subgroup relationship is going to be a parent-child relationship. So these might be businesses within the greater group, for example, right? They fall under the umbrella of a group. Or another example of that might be different levels of government. It's the same government, but you're dealing with different departments. So it's a parent-child relationship. Um, also, external group relationships are going to be um, relationships that they have with other groups, but it's not parent-child. So it may be a strategic alliance, or maybe they're lawyers, or maybe some other relationship. But again, it's helpful to know this information and to have it documented properly. And then individual relationships, such as things as uh, the many affiliations that an individual can have, which I've already spoken about, or family relationships that exist in a community. Um, again, we've got a great example of that with Bob, right? Um, so it's helpful to understand who you're speaking to uh, when you're going into, uh, into a community. And lastly, employment and skills, being able to track uh, somebody's skills or, or their, their employment history, what they've done so that you can understand what their skills are within a certain community. So these are some of the things that um, a lot of our customers are, are tracking and, and they say make a really big difference uh, to being able to document the landscape of, of their communities. This is my last slide. So some other best practices, and these are also some, I'd like to call them trends, but it's not so much trends, what we're seeing it happening out there right now. Um, being able to track stakeholder group attributes, right? So being able to report at the, at the First Nations level, at the Métis le level, at the, at the Inuit level, for example. Um, tracking election dates. I mean, I know that's something that you, that you speak about, um, you know, during your course, Bob. Uh, documents, agreements, and email records. So being able to, to have all of that in one central data repository and being able to link any communications or commitments or events that you've had about these certain documents, whether they be IBAs or whether they be any other types of agreements or contracts that you're working towards, right? Keeping everything in one central location and having the ability to reference other records with that puts a story uh, to all the work that has gone into developing those documents. And then email records. Um, emails are unique because more and more people do things by email. Um, however, if I send you an email, and you send me back an email, and I send you another email, now we've got an email thread, right? And the first one had an attachment, and the second one didn't have an attachment. So if I just copy and paste that into my record of consultation or my community engagement record, that's what people are going to be reading. So I'm making people read a thread of emails to understand what happened, right? So having a tool that enables you to quickly summarize exactly what happened, but have the original kept as a document should you ever be challenged on your interpretation of what happened is essential. And being able to keep those records centralized with all of your other communication <coughs> records in the database. Uh, confidentiality, so being able to, um, if somebody shared very sensitive information with you, you know, being able to lock that down so not everybody can, um, can access that information, such as information on uh, areas of cultural significance. Um, issues, being able to track topics that people are raising. I call it, I, we call it issues, we just had to pull a terminology from somewhere. Other, some of our customers call it topics, but what you're doing is you're applying consistency to all those records in your database or in your, however you're keeping your records. And it enables you to say, okay, well, what, what are the top five issues? What are the five, top five topics that my groups have raised um, to, or brought to our attention over the last two years, right? And what are people saying about those topics? What are we doing about those things? So applying issues or topics 
and linking those to communication records enables you to mine your data that way to make better sense of it. And then finally, you've got your resolutions. The whole reason you're talking to these people is to, to understand from their perspective, um, to understand if there are any issues that we need to know about, and to have a dialogue uh, to, uh, to work to resolve those issues at the end of the day, if we can, right? So being able to track uh, your resolutions is as equally as important as tracking your issues, because now you've got um, a history of how you've gone and resolved those issues. And you can go and then report on the dialogue that went into uh, resolving those issues. At the end of the day, that's what um, the, um, the, the if you, any of you are reporting to the authorities, that's generally what the authorities want, want to see. And then finally, commitments. Again, keeping accurate records of commitments. We do a ton of work in BC and Alberta. Um, and I tell you what, people are taking this so seriously. We have, we have organizations uh, purchasing our software just for this one piece um, because it, it's all the trust, right, that goes into all the work. It's the end result. And uh, it could have uh, huge implications if commitments are not managed responsibly. And then last, lastly, um, and this can be connected to commitments as well, is being able to track incidents, complaints, and grievances. Um, if there is a complaint, how, how quickly did you get back to these people to resolve it? Right? Who go back to them? How, how was that complaint resolved?